Has the Lord done anything for you? Welcome to the worship services, again emanating from the Southside Church of Christ here in the city of beautiful Valanda, Florida. We're so glad, so very glad you're here with us on this beautiful Sunday, Lord's Day morning. For those who are regular attenders on our online service and members of the Southside Church, you know our opening mantra, I eat it, our concept and our precept we live by. Help me, help the preacher this morning. One, two, three. What you see is what you say. What you say is what you sow. What you sow is what you reap. What you reap is what you are. What you are is what you give. What you give is what you get. And what you get is what you deserve. God bless you. God keep you. We're thankful and so glad. Remind you that every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. and every Wednesday night, 7 p.m., you can view our broadcast. Sunday morning worship, 11 a.m. And Wednesday night broadcast on Bible class, 7 p.m. every Wednesday. And this will go on in perpetuity until the Lord comes back prayerfully. Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, you can view us on Southside Facebook, Southside YouTube channel, 
Southside uh, website, sscoc.org, and of course the Southside app. Beloved, because of the enormous spike in and resurgence of cases here in Central Florida, we have no timetable currently for our return back to corporate worship. Uh, the leadership here, the elders and I, uh, prayed for wisdom and God gave it to us. It was always in my mind, my heart, and the leader's mind for us to wait this out. I think I stated that to you on numerous occasions. And that decision has proven to be wise and prudent. Uh, there are congregations, even in the Church of Christ, who opened a few weeks ago, who are now shut back down because members were affecting each other at worship. And so, beloved, it would be uh, a good while longer. Uh, we don't know when, but it would be a while longer before these doors swing open on welcome hinges to the masses. Be prayerful, uh, uh, be diligent, uh, be careful. Please continue to follow all the CDC uh, guidelines of social distancing. Be sure to put your mask on in public so you can stay safe and we will keep you abreast of when it is uh, that we'll come back here to the building, but it will not be in the foreseeable future. Reminding everybody, today, on this day, July 12th, uh, at 12.30 p.m., after you have time after the broadcast to refresh yourself, uh, call in, the, the number's on your screen, we have a Southside prayer call. And if you're not a member of the Southside Church of Christ, you too can call in. The elders and I will be on the call entertaining your requests, listening to your testimonies, and we will catalog all of your requests, and then one of the elders, as the Bible says in James 5, or both of the elders, rather, will address your request in prayer. That's today. You see the number and the access code. Please participate. In a couple of weeks, I'm not exactly sure, we'll have a Southside congregational meeting via of Zoom. That would be a visual, a video call. T today's call is audio only. We want to have you on there, listen to you, talk to each other, uh, pray for you and with you. But in a couple of weeks, we'll have a video call and we will address some of the updates you need to know about the happenings here at the campus at Southside. Now, beloved, many of you have noticed and continue to contact me because my afro and my beard are growing. Uh, I'm not able to go to the barber shop uh, to get groomed properly. And so you're noticing that a man of my age, 58 years old, can still grow an afro. I, I like some of you brothers. I ain't have to shave mine off because mine still works. Uh, beard and, and, and afro is growing. Uh, I feel like I'm back in the 70s almost. Uh, but please don't be distracted uh, by my aesthetic appearance. Please try to concentrate on the word and the will of God. And as soon as it's possible, I may keep it long after this. Just get it groomed and aged and outlined and uh, bring the fro back to the pulpit. Uh, but just keep us in prayer. Happy birthday in July, Aaron Rich. Happy birthday, Latoya uh, Kiki. Uh, uh, Sabrina Crosby, happy birthday. Bishop Cromedy and Kendall Lauren Meeks, happy birthday on the 14th. Johnny McCauley has a birthday. Emmanuel Lennard, Tyrone Salters, happy birthday, Deacon, this month. Charles Crosby, O'Shea Williams have the birthday. Chris Blanton, Elena Chapman has a birthday. Cherie Leith, one of my daughters, Cherie has a birthday. Zariah Tonso, a uh, beautiful daughter of Michelle and Mario has a birthday. Uh, Terry Gurley, happy birthday this month. Uh, Deshanta Harrison, happy birthday to you. Tammy, Tammy Birdsong, favorite member, happy birthday. Adrian Brown, yay, Adrian, happy birthday. Goldie Blanton and Shadon Cobb all have birthdays in the month of July. I want to welcome, the internet has been such a blessing. We've already had two people to place membership. They're just viewing and 
Uh, some of them have visited the church many times, but had never placed their membership. But during the quarantine, uh, they have called me and placed their membership. And we're glad to have them, Sister Robinson and Sister Reeves, pre previously have done so. Today, let's add some more people who are miles away, but just say, Southside is my church. I, this is my, that's my home. I watch Wednesday, I watch Sunday, and I want to be affiliated with Southside. I want my tithes and offering to go to Southside. Cassie Barber, all the way from Vallejo, California, the mother of Sister Trey, uh, tells everybody, Southside is her Florida church home. LaDonna Johnson and Michonne Dakota, two daughters of one of our deacons, Johnny Johnson. That's LaDonna Johnson and Michonne Dakota. One in New Jersey, one in Michigan. Both have fallen in love with the Southside Church. I, I know it's because of their parents, Johnny and Eunice, but they are enjoying the broadcast, appreciate the broadcast, and they want to have the affiliation with the Southside Church. Welcome, we're so glad to have you. May God bless you and may God keep you is our prayer. Beloved, let's move expeditiously to the word of God on this beautiful Lord Day morning. The book of Hebrews chapter 12, we are launched in verse number one and we will conclude in verse number two. The book, New Testament book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse number one. You know what Brother Leonard wants to talk to you about, preach to you about, uh, teach to you about, uh, pontificate with you and for you about that winners never quit and quitters never win. The book says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number one, wherefore, seeing we are all surrounded or compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us then lay aside every weight and sin which do it so easily beset us or ensnare us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now while we're running, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Winners never quit, and quitters never win. Beloved, we read from the New Testament book of Hebrews. The authorship of this book officially falls into the category of anonymous. For there is no conclusive proof of who wrote the book of Hebrews. Yet most scholars and theologians believe it has the same tenor and tone of other Pauline epistles. And I happen to concur with that assessment. This letter, no matter who wrote it, is measured. This epistolary is meaningful and is written from a mature mind and pen. The Hebrew letter explains the danger of going back. The Hebrew letter explains explicitly the perils of quitting, or stopping, or being deterred, or being distracted. The Hebrew letter explains arguably, like no other book in the Bible, that the law of the Old Testament pales in comparison to the covenant and the promises of the New Testament. Arguably, the most notable verse in the Bible is Hebrews 11 and 1, when the Hebrew writer declares, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not seen. That same writer goes on in Hebrews 11 and 6. Remember, Hebrews 11 is the hall of fame of faith in the Bible. So in Hebrews 11 and 6, he declares, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must first believe he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, the Hebrew writer in chapter 11 uh, segues us into chapter 12, 
by providing us with a long litany of those who have habitation into the hall of fame of faith. He mentioned Enoch, who walked with God. He mentioned Noah, who built the ark. He remembered Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the father of the faithful. He, re he mentioned Sarah, the wife of Abraham. He mentions Joseph and Moses and Joshua. He mentions Rahab, Samson, and David. And now he has catapulted us in the chapter 12 where we shall dwell for a few phonetic moments on this beautiful Lord's Day morning. Chapter 12 opens in verse 1. You read it with me by saying, therefore. And any time in the Bible you see the word therefore, you ought to investigate what therefore is there for. What it really means is what I'm about to say is connected to that which I've already said. Therefore, uh, the Hebrew writer says, we all surrounded and compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. Who is that cloud you're talking about? Who are those witnesses? He just mentioned them in chapter 11. And they had one common denominator. None of those great patriarchs quit on God. Even though they all operated under some difficult and dire circumstances, even though they all had issues, even though they all suffered persecution and prosecution, none of them quit on God. All of those in the Hebrew Hall of Fame of Faith kept running. They are now our witnesses while we run. All of those individuals and patriarchs kept the faith. Beloved, I don't think I need to inform you this morning that in life, things happen that make you want to quit. Oh, if you're honest today, every important entity in your life, there have been times you want to quit. In relationships, in marriage, even in church, there have been times you want to quit. Those of you who have attained any kind of scholastic academic achievement. There have been times along your education road you wanted to quit. Beloved, it is a part of life that life deals you a blow that makes you want to quit. But there's an old axiom I still try to live by. When the going gets tough, then the tough gets going. The devil specializes. He, he is a master of highlighting your shortcomings and your faults that'll make you want to quit on God. The devil will remind you of who and what you used to be. He'll remind you of what you're even tempted by right now so that you will quit on God. I think what we learn from the book of Hebrews is no matter what your situation or circumstances, no matter what you've done in the past, you ought never quit on God, even though the devil would give you ample reasons and opportunities. I don't care if you used to get high as a kite and sin all night. Don't you quit on God. Look at those in the Hebrew Hall of Fame of Faith. Uh, Noah got drunk, but he didn't quit on God. Abraham was a liar, but he didn't quit on God. Jacob was a deceiver. But he didn't quit on God. Moses was a murderer, but he didn't quit on God. David was an adulterer, but he didn't quit on God. Rahab, Rahab was a, Rahab, keep it clean, Brother Leonard. Rahab worked in the red light district. Rahab was a woman of the night. Rahab uh, uh, worked in the house of ill repute. Uh, Rahab is what some of y'all would have called a garden tool. Rahab is what some of y'all would have called a female dog. Rahab was what y'all call a trick. Rahab was what some of you would have called a skank. But Rahab did not and would not quit on God. When the devil wants you to quit, you got this cloud of witnesses in heaven sitting in the back of it, cheering you and I on, telling you, hold on, don't quit, keep 
running. Don't give up because winners never quit and quitters never win. Quitting is not an option in life. On your job, you can't get any stability. You can't get any seniorship or tenure if you quit every time you got a problem. Uh, uh, I had a fellow in Tallahassee told me he quit a job because he kept asking him for overtime, to work overtime. And I'm second to myself, I didn't say it to him, but I thought to myself, you got to be crazy. There are people that want overtime. There are people who want a job, and you keep quitting jobs. You can't quit every job every time you got a problem. You can't quit relationships, be they platonic or erotic. You can't, a romantic, you can't quit every time you have a problem. Relationships don't survive if the people involved have a quitter's mentality. You can't quit your exercise program. After one month, two months, after six weeks, it gets difficult to keep doing uh, and keeping your routine. But if you want the change that you seek, you got to hang in there. You can't quit. You can't quit your financial uh, sovereignty plan. When you get tempted to spend money on that which you declared you will stop spending money on, you can't quit. That which is good for us and best for us requires endurance. You can't do right for a little while and expect results. Meaningful things in life require you to be a winner by not quitting because quitters never, ever win. If you want your health to improve, you improve your diet plan. If you go on vegan or pescatarian, or if you just lower your caloric intake, increase your exercise and lower your caloric intake, the key is not quitting that which you're committed to. If you take your medicine that's been prescribed, you take it for a month, no, you got to keep on. I have high blood pressure. I can't quit because it doesn't make me feel any better. You got to keep on keeping on. In your marriage, you can't quit every time your spouse upsets you or get on your nerve. You got to hang on in there because winners don't quit and quitters don't win. You, you got to learn in life, do keep on running, keep on persevering, hang on in there. And the Hebrew writer says, all those in the hall of fame of faith are upstairs watching us. And as flawed as they were, and I chronicled some of their problems, they didn't quit. And neither should you and I. Let me be transparent for a moment. There have been times I wanted to quit preaching. I'm in good company. Jeremiah, that great prophet of old, that evangelical prophet of old, had said to God in Jeremiah chapter 20, he says, oh, the people got on my nerves so, more, so bad, Lord, I will preach no more in your name. And then Jeremiah remembered the word of God. He said, it's like fire shut up in my bones. I wanted to quit, but I recognize and acknowledge today, I wouldn't be here preaching in Orlando at the best church in the brotherhood had I quit years ago when I wanted to in Tallahassee, Florida. It, because I hung in there, hang in there, that I'm here standing before you today on the world wide web reaching masses of people because winners never quit and quitters never win. Yes, there are many times I wanted to quit. Yes, there are times I wanted to give up. Yes, I wanted to throw in the towel. But the Bible informs me and educates me that you got to keep running, keep going, stay in the race. Don't quit. Even when you slow down, don't quit. Isaiah declared in Isaiah 40 and 31, They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. If you can't crawl, scoot. But whatever you do, beloved, don't quit. Because winners never quit, and quitters never win. If you just give me a few more minutes, of your time before we get on the prayer call, allow me to pontificate, dissect, rehearse, and put these two verses under the crucible of investigation. 
those who listen to me preach for a significant amount of time, you know, I don't jump all over the Bible. I'm what you call an expository teacher. If I'm preaching from one verse, two verses, or one passage, and then I do a quick expository of the text, and hopefully and prayerfully to give you some meaning and bring to life what the Bible is saying in this passage. Notice what the verbiage and the lexicon says. Wherefore, seeing we are all surrounded and compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses, let us then lay aside. Now this is how you get a non-critter's mentality. The Hebrew writer says the first thing you got to do is some stuff you got to lay aside. That means there's some stuff you got to put down, push aside. Some stuff you got to separate from. There's some people you got to separate from. There's some habits and some hobbies you might need to lay aside. Uh, you, if you want to reach your goal and your destiny, you got to develop and know the things in your life and my life that we got to lay aside. If you want to be Florida fine, Tampa tight, and Carolina cute, you might have to lay aside Krispy Kreme donuts. There are some things in life, if you want to obtain and reach, there are other things to, for you to get that. There are other things you got to lay aside. The Hebrew writer said, lay aside what? What should we lay aside? Every weight and sin that easily beset us. I love the way he distinguishes the difference between a weight and a sin. He is not saying that every weight is a sin. He's not saying every sin is a weight. That's why he said every weight and sin. Those of you who've been by the schoolhouse, you know and is a conjunction word uh, that connects two things of equal value. He said lay aside every weight, weight of that which is burdensome and bulky. Weight will keep you from your destiny. It's not necessarily a sin. As a matter of fact, some weights can be actually good, but they do keep you from your purpose and your destiny. Uh, that weight will slow you down. If you're running a race, it's a metaphor. The heavier you are running, and that's the metaphor, run this Christian race, it's, weight will slow you down. A weight in life can keep you distracted. Some weights you need to lay aside. Some of you need to curb your appetite on Facebook. It's not a sin, but it is a weight. You're on Facebook all the time. That's why you don't read your Bible. That's why you don't have no family time. That's why you can't uh, educate yourself on the weightier matters of life. You on Facebook. N not a sin. Nothing wrong with it. All of us have something that's a weight to us that's not necessarily a sin to us. For me to graduate and to finish my academic pursuits in family Christian counseling, and now as a professional therapist, uh, a temperament counselor, uh, I had to lay aside the weight of golf. I love golf, that's my passion, that's my getaway. But I went a couple of years where I didn't play hardly any, because I had to lay aside, it's not a sin, but I had to lay it aside for me to reach my desired goals and destiny. Some of you need to lay aside your shopping habits. Lay aside making extra bills and using credit cards to nausea. Uh, some of you sisters, let me be honest with you. Scrap iron may not be a weight. He may not be a sin, but he can be a weight. Willie Bobo can be a weight. He may not be a sin, but he may be a weight that's keeping you from a more meaningful relationship with God. And then the Hebrew writer moves on from those things that are weight, that are not necessarily sin. Then he goes into sin. He said, now every weight and sin that easily beset us. That word beset means ensnare us. Ensnare is the things that, the sins that you are attracted to. Those are the sins you entice by. Uh, those are the sins, let me help you, that cause your name. Uh, those are the sins that when they whisper your name in your ear, you Lord knows want to answer. Those are the things that tempt you. There are some things in life that tempt you, and there are other things in life that entice you. 
And beloved, when sin is calling your name, uh, when sin is whispering in your ear, when sin is trying to entice you and ensnare you, and it never calls you by something you're not interested in. Uh, drugs don't tempt me. I'm not a drug addict. Cigarettes don't tempt me. I don't smoke cigarettes. Cocaine don't tip me. I ain't putting nothing up my nose. Don't even like to have my nose. I ain't putting up in my, nothing in my nose. Gossip don't tip me. I don't like sitting around talking about people. But all of us got something that whispers in my ear. Uh, uh, you you want to know what mine is? Ain't none of your business what mine is. Uh, but I came by to tell you today, everybody's got something that whispers in their ear. Well, y'all already know what mine is. It's butter pecan ice cream. And during this pandemic, during this, this quarantine, I have to go by the grocery store a lot more than I used to. Uh, I always ask my wife on the way home, Do you want anything? You need anything? You and Kyla want I need anything? When I go in the public, I have to avoid the ice cream aisle. Because every time I go down that aisle, butter pecan starts whispering in my ear, and it starts calling my name. Some days I hear butter pecan saying, Brother Leonard. Other days I hear Butter Pecan saying, Pastor. Other days I hear Butter Pecan saying, uh, 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 Hercules, Hercules. Uh, any means necessary, that which tempts you will seek you out, whisper in your ear, and call your name. And the only reason that happens is because that's what can easily beset you or ensnare you. Beloved, the Hebrew writer said, lay aside every weight, every sin that easily beset us. And let us then, he says, run with patience. Run this race. Don't, don't quit. Don't give up. Uh, don't get mad and take your ball and go home. Run with patience. That word patience means run with endurance. When you feel like you want to quit, you got to have some staying power. You see, beloved, life and Christianity is not a hundred meter dash. It's a marathon. The Hebrew writer says in Ecclesiastic, or rather Solomon said in Ecclesiastic, the prize is not given to the swift nor to the strong, but he that endureth to the end. You got to have some staying power. You got to hang on in there, run with patience. Next month, Sister Pam and I, we've been married for 40 years at the end of August. Ain't God good? But let me tell you, we've had to have some staying power, some hanging on in there. There have been times I know she wanted to quit. There have been times I wanted to quit. We had some dark days, had some times we were mad and was not talking to each other. There have been days in your marriage and mine where one or both of you wanted to leave. You've endured some storms, as so have I. We've had difficult days, but thank God, next month we'll have 40 years because we ran with patience. We ran with endurance. You see, beloved, nothing worth having in life, marriage, church. When you want to quit the Lord, quit the Lord's church because somebody hurt your feelings, you got to run with patience, run with endurance. Don't let anybody or anything keep you from your destiny. I love the movie The Color Purple when Miss Seeley and Nellie were being separated by Mr. Uh, at that fateful day when he ran Nellie from Seeley's life. Nellie turned around and told Mr. what you ought to tell the devil. Only death can keep me from it. You see, beloved, in life, you got to tell the devil. When it comes to church, comes to the Lord, comes to the Bible, comes to Christianity, comes to spirituality. Only death can keep me from it. Let me move because I'm about to get happy. Y'all over here side, y'all might have quiet today. I might have preached to the folk over here. Now y'all know ain't nobody here, but I remember how it used to be. Sometimes y'all over here used to be real quiet. I had to go over here. And when y'all got quiet, I had to go over here. And so I'm using my sanctified imagination. I imagine right now that y'all over here real quiet today. So I'm going to preach to y'all. Y'all know who said over here. I'm going to preach to y'all today. Well, he says, now, when you run with patience, that which is set before you. Beloved, 
in, in spiritual investigation. I love this passage because the Hebrew writer says, now run with patience the race that is set before you. Run your race, that which is designed for you to run. Uh, don't run my race. I can't run your race. Quit comparing your life and your marriage and your money and your gifts and your anointing to somebody else. Keep on running, but quit running looking at other people. That's why the Bible says, while you run, uh, keeping your eyes on Jesus. Uh, because, beloved, one of the biggest distractions in life is why you're trying to live is comparing yourself to other people. Listen, I I'm a walker. I walk every morning. Uh, uh, my wife now is an avid walker. And we both desire to walk four or five miles every day. Well, when I walk, there's some people in my neighborhood who, uh, who actually run. And when I go around to where the mailboxes are, we have a community mailbox, there's a, there's a little miniature track, and it's really a soccer field, but if you go around there enough time, you get a mile. Well, I walk in, try to walk brisk. Sometimes I can walk and slow down. Deacon Peterson and Sister Christina know exactly what I'm talking about. And there's a guy there every morning. He's running while I'm walking. And he's just lapping me. Just uh, Every time I walk one, one lap, he done ran two and a half. And he's just running and running. And if I kept my eyes on him, I'd quit. I'd feel embarrassed. I'd feel less than. So I talked to him one day. He's younger than me. He's 30 years old. He's stronger than me. And by the way, he said he's been running since he's a little boy for 25 years. See, I cannot get caught up in his race. I got to run my race. I wish I had a church in here. Y'all still quiet over here. Y'all need to help, Brother Leonard. See, I want to quit when I put my eyes on him. But when I focus on my own race, I can hang on in there and I won't quit because winners never quit and quitters never win. You see, I have become comfortable in the race that God set before me. You know by now, my style, my gift, my mannerisms, uh, some of you chronicled me as dramatic and demonstrative. My verbiage, my lexicon is different than some preachers, but I've learned to embrace my race. I know what the Lord set before me. I am what I am by the grace of God. You see, I learned years ago, and this blessed my life, I don't have to be the best, I just got to be my best. Too many people live their lives comparing themselves, comparing their race to other people's race. Sometimes I wish uh, I could do and preach like other preachers. I wish I had a more of a hoop on me. Mm, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I don't have that. That's not my style. That's not my gift. That, that's not my race. I celebrate the ones that have it. You got to run your own race. I learned that in my life, the best thing for me to do is uh, talk the same in the pulpit as I talk on the streets. And since I don't hoop the people on the streets, I don't hoop the people in the pulpit. That's my race. Some people have that gift and ability. Even when you're non-conventional in whatever your gifts are, learn to run your race. You'll never go far in life. You'll never be what you could be, ought be, and should be until you learn how to be yourself and run your race. You see, now you got to be prepared when you run your race. The race is set before you. That's, that's what the Hebrew writer meant when he said the race that is set before you. That's your race. That when you run your race, people are criticizing. They want you to be like they're used to people being, or they want you to be like them. And when you're different than them, they find fault in issue. Well, all of us need to learn that everybody's got their own race to run. I didn't write the Bible, I just preach it. He says, run the race that is set before you. And while you're running, looking under Jesus, the author, the finisher, he's the first and the last, he's the beginning, and the end, he is the Alpha and the Omega. Look to Jesus. He's our model example. And notice, and I'm going to shut down with this. He says, who for the joy set before him. You see, now he already told us to run the race set before us. 
Now he gives this analogy. Jesus, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross and now sitteth at the right hand of God. You see, beloved, you know why he endured the cross? Because he knew the race that he had before him. You see, you, when you can't see where you're going for seeing where you are, you never get where you're going. When you can't see where God is trying to take you because you're too focused on what, where and what you are. Okay, you still didn't get it. Y'all start to wake up over here. Y'all start to get quiet over here. See, beloved, Jesus was spat on. Uh, I was there and traveled the road of Dia Villarosa and, and the road of sorrow. He went from Jerusalem outside the city to Calvary. They put a crown of thorns on his head. He was beaten, bru bruised, and misused. He was scorned and scourged. He asked for water. They gave him vinegar and gall. But he was focused on the joy that, as the Hebrew writer said, that was set before him. He didn't quit even though he may have wanted to because he wasn't caught by the moment. He knew the joy that lay in front of him or ahead of him. And because he didn't quit, because winners never quit, and quitters never win, because he didn't quit on us, we ought never quit on him. And because he didn't quit, he died on the cross, and then he built the church. Because he didn't quit, he sits on the right hand of God. Because he didn't quit, he makes intercession today for you and I. In other words, they crucified him on Friday, but he didn't quit on Friday because he knew Sunday was coming. And I'm trying to tell you, even your life and my life right now, here today, there's situations and circumstances that you want to quit. Give up on your own. Throw your hands in the air and wave them just like they don't care. I like Marvin Gaye said, I want to throw up both of my hands and holler. I came by to tell you today, beloved, don't quit on Friday because Sunday morning is coming. Winners never quit. Quitters never win. Had I quit in Tallahassee at the Spring Hill Road Church, I wanted to quit many times. Had I quit then, I would not be the minister of Southside today. And at times I wanted to quit here in Orlando. Got here at the behest of Dr. Jerome Adams. 30 folk on the first Sunday I was here. First Wednesday night that I taught at Orange Center, nine people were there. There were times I was weary, I felt unappreciative, uh, I even had a stroke, some of you remember, in 2014. Uh, beloved, uh, and Dr. Adams and the elders, Brother Crumman and Brother Davis, all encouraged me to hang on in there. My doctor told me, hey, Brother Pastor, you're high strong. You're wired tight. He said, if you don't learn to release your pressure and your stress, it's going to kill you. And my doctor, Dr. Muir said, and when they kill you, at your funeral, they're going to pass out resumes and say, who's next? So he told me, he said, hey, the best thing for you to do, he said, I can't stop you from being the way you are. You are what you are. And when I, when I learned temperament therapy, that is so true. You're born with certain genetic codes, and you are what you are. He said, but what you ought not do is let things stay pinned up inside of you because you're like a vessel that'll burst. So I've learned. I'm going to get you up off me. I'm going to tell you what I think. I'm going to tell you what I feel. You ain't going to kill me. No, 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 no. So now I don't, I don't get strokes. I give them. <laughs> y'all not here, but I know y'all don't want to shout for the preacher today. But I'm learning life, beloved. I learned not to quit preaching or anything else important because, beloved, winners never quit and quitters never win. Uh, I've been frustrated like you. I've been aggravated and agitated like you. I've suffered stress and strain and drama just like you. Everything meaningful to me, it has been seasons of stress, seasons I wanted to quit. But the Hebrew writer says you got to keep running. You got to keep on pushing. And there's a cloud of witnesses, the Bible says, in heaven. Those patriarchs who had issues even more than we had, but they did not quit. And neither should you and I. 
I remember, and I'm sneaking to my seat now. Standing got good to me, because both of y'all done got this side saying amen and this side saying they got good to me now. I, I think I shared with some of y'all remember when I was in high school, a senior in high school, I think I shared with you my last semester. I needed to do really well. I wanted to go off to college, and uh, I needed to get my GPA up, and, and English, was not, English was not my best subject. And uh, uh, my, my 12th grade English teacher, Miss Joan Freeland, I, uh, I don't know if she's still alive. She was older then, so I'm sure that's been 40-something years ago. So I, I don't know where she is, but, but she really didn't like athletes. I was what they call a jock. Uh, me and my two best friends were in the English class together. She just said, like, we wore our jerseys uh, on game day and all the girls. You know, Wesley T., he's our man. If he can't do it, nobody can. The, the girls were everywhere, and, and we got out of class early to go to the games and travel. And she didn't like it. She just thought we were jocks. So I knew she didn't particularly like me. But I needed to do good to get out of uh, uh, with a better GPA to push my my score up to go to college. And so, final exam, last exam of my English career in high school, she put the test in front of us, and it was a hard test. It was really hard. I, I breezed through the first part, and then got down to the media part of the test, it got really hard. I mean, got to the point where I didn't have the foggiest idea. There's one thing if you think you know, but you gotta, I didn't have the foggiest idea. My two best friends, who also jocks in her eyes, when they got real hard, they just quit. They said, forget this. I saw Miss Freeland walk over, take her red mark and put F on their paper. That's what they used to do, put a red mark and put F on your paper. But I kept on pressing. I kept on enduring. Uh, sweat running down like great drops of blood. I'm sitting there struggling with the answer. I didn't have the foggiest idea. Miss Freeland walked by my desk. That's what teachers did. Had a, a, a glasses over her nose, bun in her hair. She walking by, making sure ain't nobody cheating. Got your number two pencil in your hand. She walks by, and I'm answering a question. I circle. It was A, B, C, D. I circle C. Inconspicuously, she points to A. At first, I thought she was trying to trick me, and I know she didn't like me. So she points to A. I had circle C. And then I thought about it. She wrote the test. So if she wrote the test, obviously, she knows the answer to the test. So I erased C, I circled A. Next question, I didn't have the foggiest idea. She's still walking around inconspicuously. And uh, I circled A, and she walked by and just very covertly pointed to D. I erased A, circled D. Next question, I had the following idea. I circled C, she walked by and pointed to B. I erased, put B. And this went on about 10 or 12 minutes. And then one time I circled something, didn't have the following idea, she walked by and just went. I said, yay, I got one right. Got one right. And so this went on and on, I finished the test. And everybody left, when you, when you finish, you can leave, you know. I waited until everybody left. I said, Miss Freeman, I, I just gotta know. The choir of mine's gotta know. Why did you help me? I know you don't particularly like me, and, and I didn't have a father. Said, she said, Mr. Leonard, and she called all of us Mr. and Mrs. She said, your two best friends, when it got rough, they quit. I had no choice but to give them an F. She said, I decided to reward you because you didn't quit. When it got tough, you hung in there. She said, I decided to reward your endurance, your perseverance. Y'all don't know when to shout. Now everybody ought to be shouting now. Hey, I'm trying to tell you, if you don't quit on God, even when you don't know the answers, God wrote the test, all tests in life, he knows the answers. And if you don't quit on God, eventually he'll give you the right answer. Because if you don't quit on God, God won't quit on you because winners never quit and quitters never win. I'm sorry, I got happy today. I'm too long. But when I'm too long, I just want to be strong. Winners never quit. Quitters never win. So let it be written. So let it be done. The grass withers, the flower fadeth away. But the words of God shall stand forever. Beloved. I want to invite you to Christ expeditiously. It's simple. It's not complicated. 
Uh, one needs to hear the gospel, the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You need to believe that with all of your heart. Repent of your sins. Verbalize, confess that Jesus is to Christ the Son of God. And you must be, not all, be, not need be, but you must be. Imperative language is used. You must be baptized, submerged in water for the remission, removal, and the eradication of your sin. That adds you to the body of the church and you walk with a penitent heart to the Lord calls you from labor to reward. Beloved, if you are so inclined to hear the gospel, we've had people to place membership today. That just means they're already members of the Lord's church. But if you are outside the bounds of safety, you need to come and be baptized into the body of Christ. If you're so inclined to give us a call, we're steady with you, meet you, and make sure you're baptized into Christ. Beloved, today it's time for us to have supper with the Lord. It is a commandment of those who are members of his blood-bought, heaven-bound, Christ-centered, arrow-proof church, Church of Christ. We're commanded the first day of every week to remember the horrific price that Jesus paid on Calvary for the sins of humanity. It was he in the upper room at the last supper, at the last Passover before his death. It was he who declared, do this in remembrance of me. It was he, Jesus, who explained the meaning of the Lord's Supper. He took a piece of unleavened bread, reminiscent of what they did at the Passover. He declared that the unleavened bread represented his body. And then he took the fruit of the vine in the cup, and it was representative of his coagulated blood that he would shed on Calvary. And he said that we ought to remember and memorialize this as often as as the first day of the week. So I hope you have uh, obtained and have in your possession a communion packet or have a piece of unleavened bread, a communion juice, friendly reminder, those who are members of the church, come by here any weekday from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. I'm here 99% of the time with some deacons as well. We'll give you communion packets you can get as many as you need or desire. We have them in abundance. And since we're going to be out a while, we're going to order even more so you can stay uh, fresh uh, and have an ample supply of communion packets. But if you have your communion packet, let us commune with the Lord together. Take your unleavened bread. Now, with me, let's take the fruit of the cup. Let us pray together. Father God, we're thankful, we're mindful, we're glad, we're happy. Thank you for Jesus and the church he built through the spirit of his blood. Thank you for your word that reminds us that winners never quit and quitters never win. Lord, we're thankful for this, this unleavened bread that brings notice to your body, the fruit of the vine that reminds us of your precious blood that you shed for us, for wretched men like people like us. Forgive us, guide us, lead us, bless us here at Southside and beyond. Bless those with COVID directly and indirectly affected. Bless our society to be healed of social and racial injustice and bless us in every imaginable way. Bless our economy to be restored. Bless us to be a better husband, wives, daughters, sons, and people of faith. Guide us and lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, let's get happy. Let's get joyful. It's time to give. It's time to show God that we're not going to quit in our giving. Our financial circumstances will not be a, affect our giving to the kingdom of God. Winners never quit. And quitters never win. Givers are always blessed. And non-givers are never blessed. And so, beloved, let's, let's follow the scriptures that upon the first day of every week, as Paul's letter, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1, to 1 and 2, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him so there be no gathering, Paul said, when I come. So your tithe, your offering, your lay by, your, your first fruit of all your increase, now's the time for you to be beneficent and kind and generous with God. You want more, give more. Uh, I wish I could explain it to you, and I'll just preach about it one day. But, beloved, if you want to give and desire to give, and if you're a member, you are obligated to give. It's what you owe God. You don't owe me. You owe God. If you are so 
uh, inclined to want to mail in your lay by. Some people still do. Uh, P.O. Box, Southside Church of Christ P.O. Box is on the bottom of your screen. It's a secure P.O. Box. That's why we don't ask you to mail it to the building. We want it to be secure. We don't advise you to mail it in cash, but you can mail a check, money, or a secure funds to our Southside P.O. Box at the bottom of your screen. If you're so inclined and you don't want to mail it, you don't want to give online, you can come here when you pick up your communion packet, slide it under the door, we'll get it, and we'll deposit it for you. But ponderously speaking, most people give online. You see it on your screen now. There's three online giving opportunities. All three are safe, swift, and secure. Southside Giveify, by far our most popular, is very safe, punch now and give. It keeps a record of your giving all year. Uh, Southside Cash App, you can see how to do that online. Safe, secure, keeps a record for you. All Southside PayPal, either one are safe, secure, and swift. You can give now to the causes and the kingdom of God. It's been my distinct pleasure and honor to preach to you again today. Always remember, beloved, and never forget that winners never quit. Quitters never win. Join us in a few on the South Side Prayer Call. The information is on your screen. God bless you. God keep you. This is our prayer. Amen.